So when they said, you know, do a conference, I was thinking breakout rooms with like maybe 20, 30 people in them. This is not exactly what I signed up for, but we shall persevere. Uh, so, yeah, the talk is, can a crusty Go program outperform a well-written Rust project? And when I say well-written, written, I mean the one that I'm comparing against is actually really pretty good. Uh, I'm Ben Boyter. You can find me, Boyter, pretty much everywhere, Twitter, whatever. My official title is Tech Lead. I'm a code monkey. I write lots of code. Um, and Kablamo does a lot of Go projects. And that was kind of a problem for me when I joined because I didn't actually know Go. And I was looking for an excuse to, to learn it. And because I didn't know Go, I got landed with all sorts of projects, Java, C Sharp, whatever, because I'm quite comfortable and happy working with those. And one of the ones that we got was sort of, can you improve this application? So it was a HTTP app with JavaScript front end, lots of APIs, and we sort of looked at it and said, yeah, this is gonna take about six weeks. That turned into a one year death march. And what do we all do when we run into death marches or something that we didn't like doing? <coughs> We overcorrect for our past failures and work emotional volatility into our decision tree. <laughs> so the problem was is that the, the project was a code iceberg. Now, I don't know who coined this term. Um, the first I heard of it was Gabriel Weinberg of DuckDuckGo. There's a very thin layer of stuff that you can see at the top, and then there's this massive chunk under the bottom. And what you really want to do is find those code icebergs so you can actually estimate correctly. So how do you actually spot these things? It's a, it's a tricky one. So there are a bunch of tools out there called slot counters. Um, probably the most famous and the original one is a thing called clock. It stands for count lines of code. Um, as it says there, it counts blank lines, comment lines, tells you what language is in it. You point it at a directory and say, what's in this? And it will tell you it's, I don't know, 50,000 lines of Java, 10,000 lines of C. Gives you an idea of what you're, what you're doing. It's very full featured. And when I say full featured, this will output to SQLite. <coughs> It'll compare multiple different things. It's really an impressive piece of software. Uh, it's also probably not known for being very fast. It's written in Perl. <laughs> so, the next way that you can spot code icebergs, and this is something that Visual Studio does really well, is you can calculate cyclomatic complexity. So inside Visual Studio, you basically go, give me the code metrics, and it does the same thing. And you can see here you get uh, lines of code, and you get a few other things. The one that's really interesting to me, or I've always liked, is cyclomatic complexity. And what this does is it has a look at all the branching conditions in your code and says, we will increment the number for each one of that, and then you can sort of look at, well, okay, I've got 10,000 lines, and I've got a complexity of one. Well, this is probably just some sort of file that doesn't really do very much, versus I've got 50 lines and 500 complexity. What the hell is going on in there? It's a bit slow. Um, what this actually does is it builds an AST under the hood, and it only works for the languages that Visual Studio plugs into. So you, you can't use it all the time, whereas Clock works on the actual files. So what am I thinking? We totally need another code counter. I'm not original. I went and had a look and see who else has considered this idea, and it turns out there was a lot. So there was Toke, which I think is a fantastic name, by the way, uh, and Locke. Both of those are written in Rust, and both of those claim to have excellent performance. Locke claims to be faster than Toke, or did at the time. Uh, there's also this polyglot one. Has anyone heard of a programming language called ATS? Oh, good, one person. Uh, that's probably the most complex ATS program. It's written by Vanessa McHale. If you've worked with ATS, you've probably heard of her. She's a very, very, very interesting programmer. I suggest following her on Twitter. She's a, a hoot. And there's also Lock Count. Lock Count is actually written by ESR, Eric S. Raymond. So that's kind of interesting. And there's also this other one called Go Clock. When I started this, I didn't know about Lock Count or Go Clock. So I thought I was being original with the choice of programming language, but turns out I didn't even win that. But the spin that I was going for is I'm going to calculate some value for code complexity so I can try and spot those code icebergs. And of course, we need the obligatory XKCD. We need more code counters, of course. So my goals were I wanted to learn Go. I didn't know it very well. I'd written some CLI tools, not very much. I didn't know much about Go routines, channels. Uh, I wanted my counter to be as fast as possible. And I wanted to push the CPU limits, which is unlikely, or my limits, which was highly likely when I started. And I wanted to be as accurate as possible. I didn't want to trade off um, accuracy for speed, because usually you have this, this trade-off is, do I go for accuracy or do I go for speed? And they usually come off of each other. And last thing, wanted to estimate complexity, which none of the other tools did. And that's to help me spot those code icebergs. 
So I'm sure you're all sort of roughly familiar with how Go works. Uh, you build Go routines and you use channels to pass things between them and you end up getting something like this. So in this particular case, I was where I need to walk the file tree, I need to find files that I actually want to count, I need to read those files into memory, I then need to process them, and then I need to summarize all of those results and display something to the user. Four-stage pipeline, um, everything separated with uh, uh, channels. Um, most of them have got um, a buffered. That's predominantly to exist, uh, exert back pressure on the previous step. It's not really for any sort of performance or anything like that. And some of these things are you know, multiple Go routines. So like the file processor, for instance, spawns out as many Go routines as if you've got CPUs. So the first thing that I really discovered is that Go's built-in file walk is slow comparatively to all of the other libraries that are out there. I think that's because it's trying to be deterministic. Don't quote me on that. So I ended up writing a, uh, a file walk benchmark because I wanted to see which one is actually the fastest out of all of the libraries that are out there. And I found four. One of them was Go DI walk, walk, C walk, and there's the native down the bottom there. Go DI walk, interestingly, is actually runs in a single Go routine. The other two are attempting to be running in parallel. And it's still the fastest. And the reason for this is that it avoids os.stat calls, which are reasonably expensive. Generally, you don't really need to know the size of the file before you process it, as I didn't, but it's occasionally useful. So that might not work for you. So if you're looking for one, go for go walk if you need absolute performance. Unfortunately, it still wasn't fast enough. Um, my evil plan at this point was to make it run in parallel. So I had a look at all of the folders within the directory that you pointed at, or the directory that it was running in, and said, how about you spawn multiple Go routines to process them? And that worked pretty well, but it gives you a new problem with git ignore and ignore files. Does anybody know what that problem might be? No, it's not that OS ignores it. It turns out that a lot of repositories have multiple. This is actually supported by Git. I discovered this a couple of weeks ago. I actually found a repository recently that had 25,000 Git ignores in it. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. That is a real repository. And I found many with thousands and thousands. So, and the thing about Git ignores is they actually improve the results, the same with ignore files. So you can't really ignore them. You need to actually use them. So, the problem really existed in this particular case with channels. So, as mentioned, channels are great for unidirectional work. They're not really good when you have cyclic stuff, which is what this falls into. A guy down in Melbourne by the name of David Bagerman, who's actually helped me a lot with SCC, uh, he wrote this particular tool just to solve this particular problem called Kuba. I would suggest you go and have a look it out and give him a GitHub star. He's a great guy and he, I don't know, needs a boost. He's only got four stars. I would like to see that go up a fair bit. So we've managed to read the files in a nice, we know what we're going to process. Now we need to read them into memory. Now the important thing with any performance code is you need to know your use case. So I sucked down copy, I think it was the Linux kernel, I said what is the average number of bytes in an average, number, in an average code file? And it turned out to be about 19,000. So I was like, okay, 19 KB, I can work with that. The next thing you find out is about memory maps. Does anybody know what a memory map is? Great. Who knows when memory maps are faster versus slower than just reading the file into memory? Hmm. When should you use a memory map if you need performance? Uh, if the file's on CDMRA. That's when you should use it in any case, but it turns out um, you're probably better off using Go's scanner in that case, actually. When I tried that, they were roughly equivalent. The memory map didn't actually buy any performance, and it actually hurts you a fair bit. See, what memory maps do is they keep all the bookkeeping of where the file is in, on disk. So if you say, I want, you know, byte 10 to 100, it will go and keep track of all of that bookkeeping for you when you're scanning through it. It's kind of expensive when you have a look at how it's done in the kernel. Um, I'm working with small files, so I just went with IOU two, IOU tilt and read it into memory. One of the annoying things is I spent a lot of time looking into this. I made the, uh, the rookie mistake of, I saw something that was slow, I guessed what it was, and I tried to fix it, and it turned out I was completely wrong. That's one of the reasons why I had to go back and add things like multi-threading on the file walker, because what you can see down here is, this is where I was running it, I added output to see where is the, the performance issue, and it turned out that the walking took almost as long as the program took to run, and the CPU was low, which suggests Ah, it's actually the file walking that's slow. I wasn't able to feed the CPUs fast enough. So then we get to the third step. 
So there's three main ways that all of these particular tools count code. The first is to use regular expressions. This is what clock does. The second is to use an AST, and as I mentioned, that's what Visual Studio does. It's actually able to understand it. The problem with regular expressions is not actually that they're slow, it's that you get inaccurate results. So clock, for instance, if you embed a string with, what, with a comment in it, or what would be a comment for that language, it then starts counting everything after that as though it was a comment and you get incorrect results. It's got a very good example on its homepage demonstrating this. The problem with the AST is it's slow as well, uh, but you also need to build parsers for every language and that's just not gonna happen. So I ended up choosing the third option with the state machine, which is what all of the tools, all of the tools that I'm discussing or comparing against actually use. So I built the state machine, I got everything working, I got some level of accuracy. And this is kind of what the results look like when you run it. So I'm running this one while calculating the complexity for this project as well, actually. And the result that we'd want to see is that workers.go pops near to the top, which it does, it's the second one. I know, personally, that's the most complex file in it. It found it as well. So all of a sudden, if I was told to maintain this particular thing, and I've never seen it before, I could run against it and go, workers.go, I need to have a look at that. Nice thing is there's lots of tests for it, so that brings me some level of confidence. And it goes down, you can keep going and see which ones might potentially be a problem for you. So this is, again, it's running it. This is without doing it per file. This is actually, I think this is Redis. Yeah, this is Redis. So I ran it against the Redis project. The problem at this point, excuse me, is that all of the performance that I had put in was gone. So every second that SCC was counting, wall clock time, every, uh, sorry, every, yeah, every, no, sorry, every second that Toke and Lock and all the other tools were counting, SCC was taking two. So, you know, at this point, my vision darkened. I imagined the guys in front of me, I'm like, you're mine, I'm going to crush you. <laughs> so, going fast, this is uh, Jackie Stewart. He's a very successful Formula One driver. Um, and he came up with this quote that you don't have to be an engineer to be a racing driver, you do have to have mechanical sympathy. And I actually agree with this. This is, it's very much, you don't need to know how to design a CPU from scratch, you don't need to know how to write assembly, you don't need to know what a SIMID instruction is, but you should probably know what they are so that you can think, well, how could I optimize my code to take advantage of that? So I proposed this, how to go fast in 2019. Now the quote there is from the, one of the authors of, I think it's BSD Grep, you know, you wanna make your programs do practically nothing and then they go really fast. So I would propose to amend this a little bit further because if you look at advice on how to go fast sort of 15 years ago, it would be do less. The CPU runs at a certain clock speed. You can't make it do anything more within that thing, so you just have to do less. If you want to go faster wall clock time, do less. True. It's a little bit different in 2019 because CPUs change their, their, their clock speed. We've got multiple cores. And you've got advanced instructions like the SIMID instructions. So what you really want to do is do as little as possible for each CPU, you want to do as little as possible on as many cores as you possibly can, and you want to make it easy to do the next thing. The last one's probably the hardest one. That involves prefetching things from cache, fetching them from the disk, and it also means doing things like running into branch prediction fail issues. If you ever solve one of those, you feel like programming genius for about 10 minutes or thereabout. I have done this exactly one time in my life, and I felt absolutely fantastic. So the next thing you've got to do is you've got to measure. So your bottleneck is not often what you think it is. And Go is actually really good at this. It's got some great tools. Uh, Perprof, flame graphs, I think somebody mentioned that before. The flame graphs are particularly fantastic, even if they're inverted, which is a bit odd. Um, a good example of your bottleneck is not actually what you think it is was back when I was maintaining a C-sharp application. And we had a page that was taking, I think, 30 seconds or so to, to run. And we're like, well, that's no good. So we had a look under the, the code, a colleague and I, and we found that it was some ridiculously nested loop. I think it was three or four nested loops. And he instantly said, well, that's clearly the problem. We've got to refactor it to remove the loops. And I said, yes, I agree with you, but let's be good developers and profile it anyway so we can see what the actual problem is. And he agreed. And it turned out that the actual slow part of that particular code was turning strings into integers. And it was doing this over and over again. And in C-sharp, there's three ways of doing this. 
uh, we ended up changing it to the fastest one, adding a cache, and then the page load time went down to under a second. So the problem was solved. So always, always, always benchmark and bottleneck and see what is the actual issue. And then the last one is you've got to benchmark stuff. So Go Benchmark tools are pretty good. There's a great quote there from some American, I don't know who it was, in God we trust, everybody else bring, bring data. You know, prove it. If you say it's slow and yours is better, prove it to me. Don't, don't give me an academic argument. Prove it, show me the code. Code speaks volumes. Write the code, show the benchmark, prove it. So let's go a bit further. So this is some code that I actually had to write in SCC. So one of the, the things that it does is it does a lot of byte comparisons. It reads the file into memory and it processes those bytes looking for, should I turn into a string, should I turn into a comment, that sort of stuff, it's a state machine. So there's three ways, three easy ways that, that come to mind when you're gonna process bytes. So the first one is to use reflection, um, and this is inside the Go standard library. The second one is to use bytes.equal. Once again, it's also in the Go standard library. And the third is to just write your own loop and then check if the bytes are equal and then bail out if they're not. Now, which one do you think would be the fastest out of these three? Here in second, yeah. So in this particular case, it's actually the third one. Why? So reflection, that's out. I think everybody would agree that reflection is almost always slow. The second one is the standard library, okay? Which means you've got to have a look. So the nice thing about Go is you can look at the standard library and when you look into stuff, you discover it's usually not hand-optimized assembly that's just incomprehensible. It's actually nice readable Go. Turns out it's actually very similar to what I wrote. The difference is, is it's designed to work with different size byte slices. So it has to check the length before it does the loop, whereas I didn't need to do that. So consequently, inside a tight loop, I'm able to save two nanoseconds every single time I do this. It adds up. Honestly though, probably don't do this. This is just an extreme example. It makes your code less readable. But if you have constrained requirements, have a look at the Go standard library. You might be able to do better. Now this one's probably a bit hard. I'm going to try and explain it in terms. This is how the core loop of SCC actually works. So on the left is one way of doing it, on the right is another way of doing it. So what we do is for each of the bytes in the file, we loop it over them. For each byte, we go and check what state are we currently in. So are we inside a code state? And then we go and see, okay, for this particular byte, should I change to maybe a comment state because there's a character indicating a comment. If we've got that, we update the state, go back to the loop, loop again. The second one's slightly different. It starts the same way, we're looping over the file, we switch our state, and then we process the byte. But then what it does is it goes, all right, I know that the state hasn't changed, <clears throat> I'm gonna keep looping until I hit a new line, in which case I need to count the line, or I've changed state and then I break out, update my state and go to loop. Which one do you think would be faster here? You would be correct, it is the right one. It's actually twice as fast for this particular application. Can you tell me why it's faster? It's not actually branch prediction, but that's a very good guess. When I checked, it was not branch prediction. But what it actually turns out is because the outer loop is actually quite large, it, didn't, it probably didn't fit in the CPU cache. When I switched to another one, I was doing far less, you got an unbelievably tight little loop and it was able to be optimized by the CPU and it apparently loved it because we got twice the performance out of it. So that was quite a nice one that I found. This is a serious micro-optimization. Um, <laughs> I would not recommend actually doing this, but if you fiddle around with your if statements, if you're working with if statements and you've got various branches, you can sometimes get some good performance. SEC has a whole bunch of them, so when it goes into a particular state for a comment, there's a whole bunch of like if checks to see what should I do next, should I change state. And by changing them around to hit the ones that would enter some condition first, I was able to get it to go much faster. And I did this across a few times. I think the total savings worked out to be about 50 milliseconds at the time, so it was not an insubstantial saving. Once again, this is making the CPU do less and it's also being very friendly to the branch predictor. One of the other ones that we did was, was going back to old school algorithms. Now the nice thing about working on your own stuff is that you can optimize the hell out of it. I mean, I don't know about you guys, I tend to write HTTP services, if it takes an extra millisecond, who cares? 
Or in this case, I can really think about, well, how should I make this go as fast as possible? So one of the things it needs to do in, when it's in a particular state, say a comment or a code, it needs to work out, do I need to move to another state? And it does that by having a look at things like this. So should I go into a comment or should I increment the code complexity counter? First way I did this was a loop and it basically ended up being a loop in a loop. So it would go loop over all of the conditions that I might need to move to, uh, check to see if they match, and if they do, then we'll move into it. Uh, it wasn't super performant. Replace that with bit masks. Um, basically to reduce that particular initial check to just one check. And then that turned out to be not quite fast enough. I moved to tree structure. Nice thing is, is that there's no delete needed for it. So it actually was quite a simple implementation. You end up with a tree that I've basically stolen from Wikipedia down here. I've linked a great blog here that you should probably go have a look at, Malinator. All of this stuff is actually on my blog now. So if you want to follow along, feel free. Um, other big issue is the garbage collector. I don't like the garbage collector in Go, mostly because you can't tune it. You basically get on or off. And the annoying thing is that it's optimized for throughput. Um, uh, no, no, throughput for, for latency. So it's great for HTTP services. It's great for GUIs, except there's no nice GUI interface for Go. So it's really only good for HTTP. I would love to be able to say, can you just go into throughput mode? I can deal with GC collection pauses. Uh, unfortunately, I can't do that, so in SSC, I just turn it off until it hits some threshold and then turn it back on. Uh, one of the other things I do is lazy loading. So it supports 200 languages, and because we've got to turn them into a tree structure in order to work out what should we do next, we only load them as we need them. I also added caching of file names to languages because main.go appears in a lot of code bases, so there's no point actually trying to work out what language it is. I'm pretty sure it's already Go. Do stuff like that. This is most noticeable with smaller repositories. So here's an example for Redis, so it's, say, 40 milliseconds in this particular run. I should mention all these benchmarks are, are run on different machines at different times with different things going on. I'm, don't pay too much attention other than the numbers changing. Um, so if you do want to write a code counter, here's some annoyance for bottom strings. They're really a pain in the butt because you have to have all of this exception logic. All of a sudden, I don't need to ignore things. It's very painful. Uh, nested multi-line comments. Did you know that some languages support nested multi-line comments? I did not. So it turns out it's not, it's not, we're not compiling Go, we're not compiling Java, but something like Rust lets you nest multi-line comments. Why you would ever do this, I don't know. Maybe to demonstrate how to do a comment in a comment, but I've got no idea. Delaying is especially annoying in this regard because it supports nested multi-line comments, but it's got two ways of doing them and you can nest those as well. Consequently, it does not support that. I'm not adding that code. It's just too painful. Uh, Python doc strings are very annoying. People say I want them counted as comments when they're actually sort of technically a string, but they occur in some special place. So you have to add logic to check, oh, is it after a particular function? That was very annoying. And byte order marks. So if you're working with UTF-8 files, and I hope you are, that's what you should be saving your thing as, you shouldn't be using byte order marks. Uh, it's actually recommended not to do that in the actual spec for UTF-8. It's a bit annoying. You have to take into account for this, otherwise you end up counting something as code when it was actually a comment, particularly when it's you know, the first line. So the last step is to summarize everything. So we've got limited output, thankfully. And there was a very nice string concatenation benchmark that was on Stack Overflow. And it basically said, here's all of the ways that you can combine a string. And then what I did is I said, you know what, I'm not actually going to use the fastest one. I went with uh, String Builder. The reason I did that was very explicit. It ensures that you have to build with a recent version of Go, so I'm guaranteed a baseline level of performance. Um, <laughs> the other interesting thing is, I. I found a, a library that, that actually does sort of the column output for you as well. And I had a look at it, and again, it was very generic. It was twice as slow as mine's when I swapped it out. So I tested this, and I was like, oh, I'll just use mine. It's, it's, it's easier. So this is just to show you what, what we're actually dealing with. So at the bottom is clock. Now, as I mentioned, clock is not terribly fast. This is, the Redis code base is actually not very big. I actually tried running this benchmark against Linux to try and show you how bad this actually is. And all of the other ones just ended up being a smear on the left-hand side, so you couldn't really see anything. I was like, let's change it for Redis. Um, clock is, it, and this is not mentioned in any of the slides, I'll say it now. The, the author of Clock actually emailed me after I released this. He's now switched to using SCC most of the time. He still maintains Clock, but he's very happy. He said it's the tool that he wish he had. Oh, thank you. Thank you. 
So fair benchmarks. There's no such thing. I authored one of the tools, so therefore I am biased by default. Um, they all support different languages, so all of the tools support different languages. Some of them support ignore files, some of them have got string support, some of them don't. SSE estimates complexity, so there's no real way to, to make a completely fair benchmark for this. I tried to make one as fair as possible. What I did is I created a, a whole bunch of nested directories, and then I copy a file into it, and then I ran each of the tools over it, and they all produce the exact same output, or it's designed that they should all produce the exact same output. So what we're actually measuring is how quickly can they find the files, how quickly can they read them from disk, and how quickly can they process them, and then lastly, how quickly can they sum up the results. All right, let's go with the risky demo. <laughs> Assuming I can get this to display. How do I get this to display? How do I do that thing to switch it again, Daryl? <laughs> how do I move this thing to the front? I have another window. I want to make it appear up there. Windows shift right. Excellent. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is run. Am I back over here? Yep. Control L. What does Control L do? Ah, oh, I need to get back over there though. Oh, oh there we go. Beautiful. So the first thing I'm going to do is run this against my artificial benchmark. Now I've got everything to lose here because I haven't done any caching, I haven't tweaked it. Let's see how we go. So this is Hyperfine. Hyperfine's a really nice Rust tool that you should probably use if you're benchmarking uh, command line stuff. It's absolutely fantastic. It does warm up runs, it does various runs, it works out the mean, it's, it's great. You see here we're running through them all. So we've, in order to make the benchmark reasonably fair, I've done SEC and then I've done it without calculating the complexity because that makes it nice and fair compared to the other tools. And we're just waiting on Polyglot. Come on, come on, come on. And there it is. So SCC apparently runs faster than SEC, which is a nice result. And it also runs faster than Toke, Lock, and Polyglot. But, you know, that's an artificial benchmark. Let's go back over here. Let's try something that's, you know, obviously I could not pre-can. Let's try it against the Linux kernel. This one takes a little bit longer, sorry. It's more code. But we're actually counting the Linux kernel here in under a second. We're actually counting it in half a second, which I think is fairly impressive because last time I tried this with a uh, clock, I ended up to go get a coffee and came back and it still wasn't done. So we've actually moved on a fair way. The nice thing is it doesn't really matter what tool you pick, you're gonna be in a much better situation, just some of them are more accurate. Come on, come on, Lock. Lock, despite its claims, is not actually faster than Toke. I actually noticed the other week it says, uh, use SEC instead, it's more accurate. So I consider that another massive win. <laughs> and Polyglot, I should mention, Polyglot is especially problem problematic. It, you can do all sorts of things to trick it. it for instance, for Python, if you do a comment on the first line, it ignores it, it counts it as code. So it's not even accurate, unfortunately. And SCC, again, is faster than itself, and then it's faster than Toke, Polyglot, and Lock. Ooh. Now. <laughs> and I did have preparation in case that didn't work, but it worked perfectly, which is a nice change. Uh, now, where's my thing? There we go. Uh, I'm not gonna run this live. This is where I ran it to just really see how fast is it. 10 copies of the Linux kernel. And you can see here, it absolutely smokes everything. So, can it outperform a well-written Rust project? Well, the answer is yes, but all of the optimizations I put in would work just as well in the Rust or ATC or C code. Um, feel free to boast it anyway when people mention Rust. Um, <laughs> the cost is, is that you kind of lose out on Perform on, on readability, you, you, you have to rebuild everything. Um, the nice thing about rebuilding the wheel, though, is that you can kind of make yourself a round one, which is kind of good. Um, <laughs> but yes, it, it definitely crushes. Uh, and I think the nice thing about Go is that it makes it easier to implement this stuff. If I had written this in Rust and I actually tried, I don't think I would have gotten as far as I had. So that's a massive win to Go's readability. And I believe I'm out of time almost exactly. And I'll go for a Jeb Bush, please clap. 